something that was really high tech. We went for something that has my name on there, which is spelled wrong. But that's fine. Some technology we were just listening to. It's high tech stuff, okay? Hey, listen, this is Occupy. I love you. Don't have to spell nothing, just do stuff. That's right. Uh, my name is Maureen Taylor. I'm the state chairperson of the Michigan Welfare Rights Organization. Uh, Mr. Mr. Scientific Engineer, Mr. Scientist, young man, what is your name? Jason. I, I need you to come by my house later so you can talk about this Comcast box that I have that you seem to be telling me I don't need no more. But we'll talk about that later. I was fascinated by that part of that discussion. Yeah, we work on that Comcast box. I, I wanted to talk to you all today and try to convince you to look at the world that I have to look at every day. There are some 237,000 welfare recipients, mothers and children, that by the end of June will all be separated from cash assistance because they have reached their four-year limit of cash assistance, of cash assistance eligibility. And I'm, I'm confused and I'm perplexed and my, my heart is totally broken because I've never lived in a city or in a state that has indicated that women and children don't have access to capital, don't have access to funds anymore. I never lived in a situation like this where women and children are under attack. The average welfare recipient in this state and in all states across the nation are blonde, blue-eyed children. And so I lament every day over a system that will allow abject poverty to be infused into people's homes and I lament even more the fact that my community, and when I say my community, I'm talking about low-income, working, blue-collar people, failed to comment when this doggone thing happened. I think oftentimes, I try to be a, uh, a student of history, and I think about Jewish mothers who must have known that there were bad things happening up on the hill indicated by the, blue, the plumes of smoke that were going up. I often think about Native American mothers who knew that there were bad things going on. I often think about African mothers who knew that there were bad things going on because the children disappeared and they didn't come back after searching and searching and searching for them. And I'm in that predicament right now where because I am truly a revolutionary, I'm caught between my sadness, profound sadness, and my almost intolerable anger. I work hard to be on the side of nonviolence, and it's hard. I'm on the fence, and every now and then I fall over to the other side. Uh, I don't have a problem with a left cross and a right hook and a quick kick in the ass. And oftentimes I find myself in, that, predi in that, predi that predicament and in that position, who do I hit first? I am clear that it is this horrible system of capitalism that is crashing. This system of capitalism that is like Jaws. It's a feeding frenzy. It knows nothing but eating, eating, eating. It cannot stop. And if allowed to continue, it starts at the toes, it nibbles at the ankles, it goes up through the legs, the knees. It cannot stop. It is what it is. And the many times that I have cautioned, members of my organization have cautioned people and have explained it clearly. If you don't do something about this, it's coming to a neighborhood near you. And now every union across the nation is calling on welfare rights. Will you help us keep our union contracts? Every organization across the nation calling us, will you help us keep our 501c3? Every organization across the nation calling to ask for welfare rights. You all are assertive women, 
assertive men, organized, influential. Will you help us keep what we have? And we always say yes as we walk over the bodies of all of my members that have already been shot and killed. Now, how do I deal with this? How angry am I? How sad am I? And which one of those emotions need to go first? I grapple with this every single day. I've been out talking to the wonderful folks at Occupy because I have so much hope, so much faith that maybe, just maybe, we have some people certainly across the nation, hopefully in this state, possibly in this city, <clears throat> that have the capacity to move this fight forward. And this fight is one about survival. I listened to this outstanding young man give this detailed explanation about what's possible in terms of new uses of energy. And I'm very, very interested in that. But I can tell you we're not there yet. I don't know what to do about 237,000 families that within the next 30 days, 60 days, 90 days will be outside. I don't know if I can get him to move quick enough to figure out how I can get two or 300,000 houses right quick and move them into those places so that they'll have a place to live. I don't know if the technology that he has so brilliantly described is going to be accessible to low-income people quick enough for us to be able to use solar and wind and these other kinds of industries. I'm clear that these things exist, but I don't know if I can get him to move quick enough to stop the carnage. My guess is, is that I can't. You know, the thing about Occupy that's so great and that makes you so special and so endearing to so many of us is that you represent a breath of fresh air and hope because your courage says there are things that are wrong and we need to address them right now. The thing about Occupy that's so great is that it doesn't say let's go to the lawyers and let them craft discussions about legal points of view. You didn't say that. The thing that's so great about Occupy is that you saw that something about a 1% and it's something about a 99% and the math doesn't add up right. It's something about Occupy that's so fresh and brings us so much hope. But still, I live in the here and the now. And I want so much for things to change. I'm always on the verge of tears. I am always on the verge of wanting to fight but I don't know which one of those emotions need to take center stage because it's not just me with a broken heart. There's so many of us that are so thoroughly disgusted at the way we are forced to live. And I'm saying forced because I know we don't have to live this way. We don't have to live like this. If you believed that humanity has the capacity to do more, I question why don't we have the courage to step out and say and do the right thing? What the hell is it? You can't die but one goddamn time. I swear to God, you can't die but once. And if that's the case, how come we are not making our lives worth something? If you ain't got but one shot at this, and when you die, if you believe in an afterlife, maybe you come back as a butterfly or, or a hippopotamus or whatever it is, but you got one shot at this, why are we not making every breath we take mean something if there's some insurance that has to be paid to get to the next place, if you believe that? The faith and the hope that I have in Occupy is that you won't stop dreaming, that you won't stop envisioning the kind of world that's possible for us to have, that you won't get tired, burned out, and that whatever that world is that we're trying so hard to create, you will at least take another step, and then another step, and then yet another step to help get us there. I can make a commitment. I can dream with the best of them. I can fight with the best of them. I can outrun everybody in this room. I can get us 
to where we have to go. But under your leadership, when you get tired, the commitment is, I will bring my team for resources, because you're going to need me before the, the night is over. I'm so engaged in trying to find out what we have to do about 227,000 welfare mothers with at least one child. If there's two, we're talking two times 227. Thousand. If we're talking three children, we're talking about three times 227,000. And my engagement doesn't stop there because I continuously wonder why all of the world is not looking at what happens here. I would have thought every American alive would have been commenting on what the hell is it going on in Michigan? We got a Republican governor that has decided he's going to overturn elections and appoint people, call them emergency managers, and do this all over the state. I would have thought every living person in this country would have went back to their civics books and said, there's something wrong with this. You can't overturn an election and appoint somebody. You can't do that. There's something wrong. I would have thought every living American would have been packed up their bags and would have been on their way to Michigan saying, look, there's something wrong here. And we're going to go here so we can understand what this is about because we can't have this kind of tyranny, this kind of dictatorship. And it looks like when I check out 75, I check out 94, I look at I-96, and nobody on the way. And I ain't understanding this. I know that whatever it is that they're going to do around the world, certainly around the country, they're going to try it here first. Because this is a home of organized labor. We didn't take this kind of crap 20, 25 years ago. What the heck has happened to make us like this now? And before I can get the answer, before I can find the answer, I think about my brothers and sisters in Occupy. And I think, well, you know what? I think that the resurrection, I think that the the solution to the problem might come looking like this, but maybe somebody else said that the, the solution go look like Occupy. Ain't got no organization. They don't comb their hair. You know, ain't got no direction. Ain't got no leaders. You know, all this, you know, let's go as it may. If it feels good, let's do it. That's what the group looks like. But that's fine. That's fine. I don't really care anymore. It could be tall. It could be short. <laughs> it could be wide. It could be thin just as long as it can be active, as long as it can be engaging, as long as it can be involved. The thing that I want to leave you with is that my community doesn't have a lot more time for you to figure out where you're going to work. I just don't have the time. My folks are in trouble. It won't be long before the suicide start. And then when I hear that call, that this particular family in Michigan, the mother killed herself and the children, it's already happened in Texas, couldn't take it another day. When that happens, that means it'll be too late. So you've got to make some decisions about where you're going to go. We're already organizing with some of the members of Occupy to start a project that's going to bring lots of money, lots of attention, and lots of focus as we identify houses that have been foreclosed on by these predatory banks and move veterans into those pro properties and move low-income women with children, especially disabled kids, into their properties. And that's because my hope is, I believe, I really believe this, that this question of a moral imperative about what's right and what's appropriate is really in the minds and hearts of everybody, not just the folks in this room, but the folks across this nation. People recognize what the right thing is to do when you see it. So my guess is, at least my hope is, is that in the end of March, early part of April, somewhere around tax day, when we have selected whatever these properties are, and we start moving groups of disenfranchised people into those properties that the folks that occupy that I really want to get the credit for doing the right thing will attract the attention of all the folks that love justice. 
And I believe that just like Spock and Kirk used to talk, the needs of the many have to always outweigh the needs of the few. And I believe that we've heard that message and that we got that message. And the only thing that's holding us back is air and opportunity. My name is Maureen Taylor. I'm the state chairperson of the Michigan Welfare Rights Organization. I hope that my words have touched your heart today. And I'm going to get that young man to come to my house to work on my podcast table box. That's right. But you got to leave your gun someplace else, there, brother, because both of us can be armed in my house. <laughs> Another round of applause for Norman. Thoroughly impressed by all the speakers today, other than myself. Everybody's doing a great job. Wow, good stuff. So uh, we're going to move right into uh, our actual hosts here, Occupy Detroit. Uh, please welcome Dave with Occupy Detroit. Some safety things. After that, we're going to move into uh, the Zeitgeist Movement pre presentation. Uh, then VTV will speak, and then we'll get into the roundtable group discussions and dismissal. So uh, once again, welcome uh, Dave. Occupy. Oh man, Maureen, that was awesome. I don't know where you went, but that was like totally justifying every single thing that uh, I got involved in this movement for. Um, you know, everything that I've been doing since I started this movement, I, I couldn't, this is, this is the reason, like, Maureen totally touched me with her uh, presentation. It's really hard to follow that, I gotta say. Um, but let me just give you all uh, a quick, how I kind of got started on this whole thing. Um, and also, before I jump into that, thanks uh, Z-Day and Zeitgeist movement for having everybody, bringing everybody here. Uh, I think it's really important that we continue uh, to share our ideas, share our goals and our dreams with each other. This is really uh, what gives us power as people. Uh, sitting at home simply and, you know, thinking these things by ourselves or complaining to our friends and our family, that's not really going to get the kind of changes that we need to see in this world happen. If we're going to really see any kind of changes happen, we need to all unite. We need to all get of like mind. We need to all get on the same page. So I want to thank Zeitgeist for you know throwing this and getting this all going for that reason. Um, I kind of I kind of fell into Occupy. I think a lot of people did. I think all of you kind of fell into this room, kind of the same you know in the same light. Um, what I was doing is uh, I've kind of been you know I've kind of lived a, a semi-blessed life by having not a whole lot of worries. I could have very easily taken like a a nice coaster, easy path through, and followed all the rules and played by all the capitalistic games that you know the system has established and whatnot. Uh, my dad and, and mom certainly wanted to see that happen. Uh, I had a different agenda though altogether. I knew that there were things, a lot of things wrong in this world, and um, you know I was always kind of imparted with this idea that you know if you know if you're not going to fight for something, it's not worth having, um, and so. You know, against everything that, like, I was told to side, uh, oh, you should just take the easy way, you know, go to college, you know, get those student loans, rack them up, uh, go, go into business, get a job, run a company, all that kind of stuff. Uh, that's my dad's voice, in case you guys have never heard of him. Um, the, you know, that was, that was the message that, that he really wanted me to take uh, from, from uh, you know, him trying to raise me. But I heard, like, a different thing, and that was, you know, um... F that. You know, I mean, it was really just like a kind of like an F that. Like, I didn't have any kind of attachment to these things, like, you know, this systematic um, definition of what success is, of, of what um, happiness is in, in the world. And so I've kind of like made it my lifelong goal of going totally against the grain and making things super hard on myself for no reason at all. Um, and so, you know, I, I did the college thing, but I made sure I, I majored in, like, the most unemployable field, creative writing, which is brilliant. Um, and, you know, my writing didn't get any better for that. It was just, like, a thing to do. Um, but then I kept, like, waiting. I, I kept waiting for this opportunity, like, some chance to come or somebody to say, hey, you, you want to do something a little different? Here it is. And... 
when I was like 27 years old, I was like, what the hell am I still waiting for? I'm sitting here, I'm watching TV, my friends are burnouts, uh, I barely made it through college and whatnot. Um, and, you know, I love my friends, and I love burnouts in general. Um, so I decided to become a teacher. So, um, but no, I, you know, I wanted to do something, but just like even just getting a job as a teacher isn't like the easiest thing to do, especially in Michigan right now. And, and it's such an important thing, you know, because here we are, like, I'm, I'm 31 years old, and I've been, substitute, I've been substitute teaching now for about six years. I've been witnessing a lot of disenchantment by the next generation, and, and it just breaks my heart every day I'm in a classroom and I see another kid say, you know, this is stupid, what the hell is this about? Not that I didn't say those exact same things when I was there, but, you know, the state of the world, it, the veil's been lifted, and, and we can see all the problems that we're faced with every single day. It doesn't just plague, you know, um, you know, it's not just a recession that hit these suburban homes or whatever. It's a problem that's been going on systematically, uh, systemically since, you know, shit, for like 50, 60 years probably since World War II got over. Um, and a lot of these problems are there, um, you know, they're created by a very crafty group of people who have been in control of this, of this country, of this world for that matter. Uh, they make a lot of money off of everybody else's suffering. And they really don't, at the end of the day, look at the chart, and there's like no chart in their office to measure the amount of tears shed. You know, it's just straight up like, how much money did I turn over today? And I, that like bothers me so wholeheartedly because I'm watching these kids every day in a classroom and they're just like, you know, I hate, I hate this, I hate him, I hate her. Like, when are, when are they gonna, you want me to bump that teacher off and get you a job? I'm like, no, 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 you can't do that. Um, but I, I got sick of, of hearing these kinds of complaints and, and just kind of like shrugging my shoulders and telling the kids like, you know, uh, I stay optimistic and, you know, I'm hopeful for our future. And like, well, why? And I'm like, because I don't have a plan yet. And um, so I just started like getting involved. I started like, you know, something very similar to what, when I met Jaren, he was talking about this, this, positive, this positive autonomous action. It's so very, very important that instead of just sitting back and, and allowing our, our lives to be dictated to us and just eating the shit every day, that you can take control and you can decide for yourself, you know, how big your portion is. You know, you can use your time however you want. You know, you can decide to go ahead and, and work every day, but you could also decide not to. These are all choices. And if anything else, I mean, if, if America's... Have, has anything left to offer us in terms of like what freedom means, it's that ability to decide for yourself what you do with yourself. So I started like volunteering, I started trying to create like programs out of thin air to like help turn these kids around and whatever. And I found it like very difficult to do with all of like the bureaucracy and school systems to do it like in a legit way that they all uh, would be in favor of. So, um, you know, I was just kind of like, coming up with like my next plan or, or how to make this, this education thing a little bigger and a little better, uh, save a few more lives if I could, uh, you know, even get, get that far. Um, and then like this Occupy thing started. And, you know, sure enough, I found that as soon as I started going to these meetings, as soon as I started going to these assemblies, that there's something really, really beautiful and unique that, that Occupy, the Occupy movement it's, itself kind of embraces. And, it, and it's a tool. You know, it's not just an idea, it's not just a movement, it's a tool. Certainly not an organization, we're not, a, we're not political, we're void of pol like political affiliations. And so I had to kind of like figure out what this tool is, like how do you use this tool? It's like anything else, you know. Uh, somebody shows you a hammer and you're like, cool, that's for pounding in nails, but like you might not ever realize that the claw part of it's for pulling them back out again, you know. I don't know, you can take that as deep as you want. Um, basically, I'm just going to give you a brief synopsis of what Occupy Detroit is, um, what the Occupy movement is, in case you all aren't super informed, but I know a lot of, a lot of people in here are on the same page, so I'm not going to kill too much time on that. Um, generally speaking, you know, it's, it's things that we've heard about today. It's about economic fairness. It's about, you know, this huge problem of, of corporate influence in our political structure. It's about trying to, like, come together for a, like, a peaceful form of revolution. It can be done. Um, it can be done. Occupy Detroit does a couple things. 
we can serve as a, a force multiplier. You know, this is like how the tool would work. We have these wonderful, amazing things called general assemblies, which can be really painful, but you know, like if you hit yourself in the head with a hammer, it's, that's not cool. It's gonna be painful. However, if you use it like a tool, you can get a lot of amazing things done with it. And that's kind of like how I see our General Assemblies functioning a lot of times. And, and I mean, that's, that's just the nature of a revolution. It doesn't come easy. It comes with a lot of hard work and dedication. And uh, you know, you might, you, you might get your head smashed in. It's just part of it. Um, but, but we're nonviolent, I swear. Um, um, the GA is what they are. Is It's a group of people that can all come together from every kind of community to all meet in a single place to kind of voice the, the particular problems that are facing their lives, their neighbors' lives, their friends, families, whatever kind of problems people are going through. It creates this really great open forum for a large number of people to hear those problems and maybe if they have time or if they have some sort of resource they can contribute that to help solve these kinds of problems that we're facing. Uh, generally speaking, we use a, uh, the consensus process which is 90-10. Uh, you have to have 90% approval to get things passed through a general assembly. Um, and once things are passed then it's like you have the full backing support of the Occupy movement as a whole. But these are very surface things. The Occupy Movement, like I said, is a tool that does so much greater than that. Um, I work be on behalf of, uh, of Outreach as one of our working groups. And I'll explain what a working group is in a little bit, but generally speaking, um, Outreach has started a couple major campaigns around Metro Detroit. One of them is a listening campaign in which we're supposed to go around and kind of uh, invite ourselves or ask people to invite us into their different groups they're different uh, city clubs, block clubs, churches, um, political affiliations, other movements like, like Zeitgeist Movement and whatnot, um, from as many different kinds of backgrounds as possible. We want to hear what kinds of issues that people are facing, what kind of obstacles they're trying to overcome, and then we're trying to bring those things back to our assemblies to see how can we, how can we address these problems like right now. It is a right now issue, but you know, we're not all together on everything right now. So until we do, there's always going to be this kind of back and forth of, you know, we have to organize a little bit, we have to plan a little bit, and then jump right into action. So it's a bit of a, it sometimes can be a bit of a waiting game, but it's really, really important because we do everything by this consensus process. And consensus is so, so huge in our movement because it's really, like, we've all seen how democracy doesn't work as a system of voting, like, I voted for years. 60% of the time it works, 40% of the time it doesn't. Half the times I vote, I'm like, cool, that guy that I also voted for was also elected. But I don't feel that it was my vote that won that election. I don't feel that it was my voice being heard. A lot of times I see ballots and proposals come across, uh, sorry, proposals come across ballots and stuff all the time. And I'm like, Oh, that's really awesome. I'm for 95% of that, except for that horrible piece of shit right there line that I'd like to just scratch up, but I can't because i got to vote yes or no. And that's the kind of thing, these are the kind of failings that democracy is providing and, and, and have has been a part of it for so, so long. Consensus supersedes all that because it says straight up, we're going to have a real conversation right now. And if you have anything to say about it, tell us. If you don't like it, say so. If you think that this word is wrong, say so. And yeah, it can totally be a tedious, slow acting way to get something done. But it's hugely important because unless unless you feel like unless you feel like your voice is heard, or unless you feel like you are being represented by a thing, why would you ever, ever support it? You shouldn't. You shouldn't really support anything if it doesn't come from your heart. And I think that that's what Occupy is really trying to do. It's trying to allow our, us to attach ourselves to each other's dreams, each other's goals. You know, we have all of these problems that every single and they're so so far reaching because they've been they've been going on for decades. And so Occupy is addressing this now. I mean, it's it might be too late. You know, it might not be. We'll see. We'll see what we can all do as we pull together. Um, so. We we want to see we want to see involvement from everyone. It's not like Occupy Detroit is this huge 
top-down authority figure that's supposed to replace our government and dictate our lives. It's actually, it really should be the exact opposite of that. What we'd really like to see, you know, on behalf of the Outreach Committee for sure, and a lot of times when I'm up here speaking, I'm speaking uh, on behalf of, in, in quote of our friend Jamal, uh, on behalf of myself and anybody else who agrees with me kind of a thing. Um, but it's really, it really does come down to that we need to see a bottom-up occupation. We need to see these assemblies happen not just at 1515 Broadway, Broadway on Saturdays and Sunday or Saturday, uh, Saturdays and Tuesdays. Sorry. Um, we need to see these general assemblies happening in people's neighborhoods. We need to see people coming together on their blocks and coming up with a way to address the problems that they're facing right now. Uh, there's so many different issues across the board from you know, half, half the time when I'm coming down to Detroit, I don't even know if in the winter, this has been a lucky one, we don't even know if the streets are going to be plowed. That's awesome. You can't get to work if you have a car. If you're walking to the bus stop, yeah, might as well bring a snow shovel. And some, somebody to, the, to pump your heart when it collapses from, from the weight. You know, it's, it's just really horrible. And, these, and that's just one, one small, small thing. The city is not, the state is not, the nation is not taking care of, of people. It's completely sacrificed the needs, our needs, to better ourselves. We're sold this dream growing up in school that you're supposed to do better than the generation before you. You're sold this dream that you can live the way you want to live. But it's stripped away as soon as you turn 18 and you go and you vote and then you go and you end up with all these bills and you're like, oh, I'm running this rat race. It's a hamster wheel and you never get anywhere. You know, it's two steps forward, three steps back all the time. So we want to see these general assemblies or something very similar to a general assembly start up where at least conversations are starting in everybody's neighborhood. You know, I grow up, it's no secret, I grew up in the suburbs, whatever. I watch my neighbors lock themselves in their houses all day and watch TV and get on the internet and social network and whatever else they do. I have no tolerance for that. I have none. I don't even have time to have tolerance for that. I don't have time to even find the remote control half the time. But that's good. If I just accepted that fate and turned the TV on and said, what's the news guy going to tell me today? Horrible story, horrible story, horrible story. Oh, the weather's going up to 60 in February. Fantastic. Like, that would get me really far in life, I think. No, not at all. Not at all. So I kind of like try to live this model with my life where I use all of my time and all of my energy towards doing something for someone, if not myself. If I'm not bettering myself, I should be trying to help other people better themselves. Their selves. I'm an English teacher, but you can't tell. Um, so Occupy Detroit would like to see these small little general assemblies pop up ideally and then see this you know, coming together of these assemblies, coming together of these different groups and organizations where these issues that are facing every individual can be addressed and discussed as a whole so that we can all put our minds together. We can all put our backs together. You know, there's this analogy my dad always told me, he's like, you know, time equals money. And I think that that's a really hilarious thing um, in general, but really appropriate for the Zeitgeist Movement. Um, I'm, I'm going to try to connect that in a second. In my life, I've always noticed that when I have the least amount of time, I tend to have slightly more money because I'm always, you know, working. In this capitalistic system, you know, the more hours you work, supposedly the more money you have. So, you know, generally speaking, if I don't have any time, I, I typically have a few more dollars, maybe I'll eat out somewhere. Um, but the same is true when I have nothing but time on my hands. Every summer I'm unemployed and I don't receive uh, compensation for that. But I have all this amazing time to do something with it. And if I just accepted the fact that, you know, um, cool, in three months I'm going to go back to work. And for now, I'm on vacation. I'm not going to get anywhere. My neighbors aren't going to get anywhere. My friends aren't going to get anywhere. Not with my help anyway. So it's really important that when we have something like time as a resource or, or money or information or knowledge, that we share these things together. Because someone needs that all the time. All the time. There are so many people in need. So many people with 
huge, massive problems. Uh, Maureen talked about all of these welfare rights being stripped away from people. Families. You know, there was just a situation a week or a couple weeks ago where our mass transit decided, hey, uh, if you work a late shift, guess what? Our buses don't run for you. Uh, enjoy the walk. Hopefully, you don't have to go too far. It's just ridiculous stuff like that. But that doesn't mean that there aren't vehicles to drive people. It doesn't mean that there's not a way to get to work. So, what I believe can happen, what I believe Occupy can really do, is kind of be this hub where we can not only share our problems and our concerns and things that we're facing in our communities, our neighborhoods, but we can also share the resources that we have as, you, as individuals. How can you help? How are you willing to help each other? If we can do all these things and bring, bring each other together, we can really truly see these kinds of changes that we all need. It's not about wanting anymore. It's about needing. So just to give you an idea of some of like more concrete things we've been doing in, in the Occupy Detroit movement, um, you know, we're fighting, we've identified a lot of major problems. Um, the one I mentioned about public trans transportation cuts, uh, this cost of energy that we're also completely dependent on all of the time. Uh, thanks Occupy Flint for having all those awesome solutions too. Um, the emergency manager laws, Again, like this failure of democracy to even function in any kind of legitimate way to preserve democracy. Uh, and then you have this long list of problems that deal specifically with property and property ownership. And perhaps this might even be, in my own opinion, one of the greatest traps ever created. This idea that a person, somehow, if you own property, you have more freedom. No, it's not really like that, but it seems that way when you can get kicked off of a public land for being there after dark. But you can, and, and you, can't, you can't stay warm by heating, like by lighting a fire. But you can somehow do all that kind of stuff at your own house. That doesn't, that's a, that doesn't make sense to me. That's saying that if you can afford property, you can afford to buy your freedom. That's totally not what this country has ever been founded on. Founded on. So that's, there's a whole slew, and just some of them are, you know, you have people getting evicted uh, from their homes that they've been paying for for years because of a foreclosure, because of a systematic failure of the job market. I mean, we live in a blue-collar town, and my whole life I've watched factories and machine shops close up like crazy. I know Flint feels, has been feeling that for longer than we have up in, in Warren. Um, vacant homes and buildings. I mean, I can't drive down the street here without seeing at least one on every other block. And that's like a small, small estimation. That's just what I can see while I'm driving. I took a walk one day downtown Detroit for all places, and I counted like 13 shops in a row. They are all completely empty. They were ready to be open, but it was only for what? Like bars and restaurants, pre-approved liquor licenses, really amazing stuff like that to give people shitty paying jobs and get them hammered all the time. That's phenomenal, I can't wait to live there. I mean, these are not real solutions. They're just like little patch fixes that they throw on these buildings to kind of make it appear like, oh, we're doing a turnaround, we built a giant stadium, come support our, our Lions, we're gonna go with a losing season. You know, this is, this is the kind of stuff that our politicians and our, and our capitalistic uh, you know, corporate entities are completely perpetuating every single day. Meanwhile, there is you know, Hart Plaza, which is every single night is filled with close to 100 people sleeping in sleeping bags, you know, huddled around each other, trying to stay warm on top of each other, trying to stay warm. There's 20 empty buildings and empty spaces down the street that if they're to try to walk into, they're going to end up in jail or beaten. I mean, these are just ridiculous, ridiculous problems that we can't just allow, we can't just allow to continue, uh, to continue on like that. And Occupy is trying to address these, you know, where we can. We need a lot of people, though. We need, it's not just about a movement. It's not just about this particular group trying to affect and change these problems. It's about somehow finding a way to, for us to empower each other so that we can all address these problems because they're not gonna change if just a handful of 200 or 300 people get together and yell about it. It's gonna take a lot of work. 
So those are, those are just uh, <laughs> neighborhood cleanups. If you've ever walked around, well, I think just about every neighborhood has a problem with people throwing shit on the ground. Um, I know mine does. If it's not, you know, if it's not just like people not caring, it's like punk high school kids that I teach. Um, and I love, by the way. Um, also, like, you have all this abandoned land as an untapped resource that, again, is just going to waste. There's people getting evicted from their homes, creating more, un more vacant land. They're in the process of rezoning things and having all of this property kind of uh, exclusively only for sale for private entities. Well, people are being kicked out of their homes that are going to be rezoned to be sold to private entities. Where are these people going to go? Are they going to join the crew at Hart Plaza? I just don't understand where they think or how this system is operating in a way that they think that this is solving issues or, or even, even slightly pretending to band-aid a problem. It's, it's not at all. Um, you know, I mentioned homelessness. Uh, damn, right? We live in one of the richest countries on the planet. We can't, we can't put people under a roof. We can't provide for a shelter that doesn't kick you out at 7, at 7 a.m., I think is the roll call when they kick you out. You know, because then you gotta just start your walk walk around until you find a place to sit down. Um, America. Um, you know, so these are the kind of problems that all come out at our general assemblies. And, you know, there's a lot of stuff that I was slightly aware of, but since I've been a part of this movement, I've been like, I've seen firsthand. I've, I've met people who are suffering from these things on a regular basis. And these problems don't go away. They don't go away from. Um, and, one thing that's been really cool about these assemblies is that I've seen a lot of really great, like, progressive startups. Like, we, and I think every Occupy does this, is they have, we have working groups that we form, and working groups are specifically for because somebody stands up in an assembly and says, hey, I'm really pissed about this, and I want to find a way to solve it. If anybody's down, I'm going to be over there. Come talk to me. And it's been, do it's been doing really good work. Uh, we've had some really good, um, really good work groups formed uh, at our General Assembly is doing just that. Um, and again, you don't have to be some kind of Occupy Detroit member or Occupy Movement member. It's not an organization. It's just an idea. It's just a thing. It's a place. You don't have to be that to make a, an announcement, to announce that you have a problem, to say that you want to do something to help that problem. You just show up and say, hey, it's me and I need you. Um, and by doing that, by bringing in and enlisting all these people who are, you know, progressive thinking, active people who want to do something, who are able and to do something about it, it, it helps with all this, it helps us come up with like these great planning phases where we can be more strategic with how exactly we're going to meet this entity on the street that's going to try to maybe arrest us or kick us out of our homes. Um, we share these resources and... Uh, carrying out all of these projects and actions all through these small bodies called our work groups. Uh, one major working group that we formed is the Occupy Our Homes, which is uh, working with moratorium now and fighting these foreclosures and evictions. Uh, it's a frontline defense against that. Um, another one is the Golden Gate Restoration Project, which is trying to address a lot of these, a lot of these property issues by, uh, we, when we left our camp, we had a lot of folks who didn't know where to go. And, you know, some people suggested, hey, there's all these abandoned homes, let's, let's have this, this whole thing get married. So we took some of these, these folks, we led them over to these abandoned homes, and we've effectively held down these squats uh, since December. And, you know, the numbers have shifted. The people who stayed there have, have grown and dwindled back down, but for the last three months now, we've maintained six properties that we don't own, that somebody owns that have left just unclaimed. Uh, well, they claim it, but they, they don't ever come and check on it. So, you know, I don't know how mad they're going to be when they show up and they find out if they ever show up. I don't know if they're even alive or not. But if they show up and they find out that we swept everything out, you know, and, and basically boarded up and locked everything so crackheads and prostitutes can't move in there and use it for whatever fun and games they do together or separate. Um, 
I don't know what that whole scene's about, really. It's pretty true. Um, but, you know, we run into all these other kinds of problems when you try to take a house that is completely shut off from the grid. It's like you don't have an option to get wired up to the grid. So, you know, we've done stuff like created rain barrels, and, you know, what's amazing, what's amazing, and everybody I hope should know this, is that if you have a toilet in your house, uh, and you have water, you can, you can totally take crap in it, and it'll flush every single time, unless it's plugged, so you should bring a flusher. So, um, we found a couple of these houses that still had that toilet intact. So all we had to do was come up with a way to flush that toilet. All it requires is water, gravity does the rest. And so that became a, a hardcore base for some people to stay. And they felt like with that, that was all they really needed. They had the shelter, they had a place to go to the bathroom and get rid of it. We can move forward from there. So we set up some rain barrels to collect water for uh, toilet flushing and whatnot, trying to work towards um, cleaning that water to also make it drinkable as we gather it, not after we use it. Um, also, um, setting up gardens in the spot. We've cleared all the land, we pulled all the garbage out, and we're totally going to have to get with the Peace Mob Gardens to figure out some more of that details on how to revitalize that soil for sure. Um, but different kinds of sustainability projects, we're trying to come up with alternatives to creating energy. Uh, we've looked a little bit into solar stuff, but um, you know, we have all these gears and bicycles, kind of broken bicycles, kind of sitting around Detroit. So, you know, there's a lot of talk right now and planning about uh, hooking those up to alternators and trying to charge batteries by pedaling your bike, so we could have battery cells stored for you know these squatters to maintain you know some lighting and stuff. So that when the sun goes down at seven, they don't have to go to sleep right away. Um, We've been using all wood-burning stoves for the heating, and you know we're trying to always trying to find new, innovative ways to adapt that. There's some talk about uh, using rocket stoves. I don't have any models because we haven't built this stuff yet, um, but we're totally we're totally gonna do it. Totally gonna do it. Um, it's gonna be really awesome. The other thing is that when we moved into that neighborhood, we didn't really know how well we we're gonna be received. Um, by the police or by the community. Um, but every day that I'm out there working or you know the guys who are staying out there are working, there's always somebody coming through to either, you know, with like a hot, a hot bowl of stew or something to donate. Um, there's always like people stopping by trying to check out what we're doing. We get materials donated from just various builders and construction workers, uh, leftover waste materials. Uh, one hot, one guy was getting rid of an entire bay window because it had a crack in it. So it was like, hey, that'll fit. Can we use that? And some people might think it's kind of crazy to install, you know, this big ass bay window in a squat house that you don't own. That one day somebody's going to show up and say, get out. It's warm enough. You don't need to stay here anymore. But um, we're all, like talked a lot with the guys over at the squats, um, and they're all really okay with that getting kicked out of there because ultimately you know their mindset is that if they get kicked out of this house if they have to leave this particular neighborhood that's fine because they just left that neighborhood a hundred times better than how they found it so they have no problem just moving to another set of abandoned houses and doing the same thing all over again you know maybe this is a way to to restore property value maybe it's just a way to restore a sense of safety so when the kids are walking home from school they don't feel like they're going to get jumped or roped into a gang or whatever it is but it's creating hope in people's lives and it's it's showing this kind of change that you know we can do it if we just kind of bond together and, and don't relent you can't you cannot quit it's never going to be easy and this is resonating with so many people both in those communities and from the outlying communities who want to get involved and, and maybe contribute a little more to that kind of stuff. Um, the other working groups that are really, really active right now, like I said, uh, outreach. We've been doing these listening campaigns, getting those kicked off, also speaking engagements. If anybody has an organization, they just want, they don't, maybe the group or organization or union uh, doesn't necessarily have all the information and the members would like that then Occupy Detroit will send somebody 
and we can kind of answer questions and figure out what kind of misinformation maybe the media already kind of per uh, perpetrated on everybody. Um, and then this other thing we're working on is, is a mass newsletter. Uh, right now, Occupy Detroit has uh, close to a thousand people on our email list. And we send them updates when we have mass actions. Um, we're also working on a newsletter right now, uh, hope to, hopefully to get it into actual print press so we can distribute this in like a guerrilla fashion all over, all over Metro Detroit. And then the uh, last group, working group I was going to talk about was the media working group, which has really been like our hub, like our hub of information. It's where you can go to find out where and when everything is happening. It's the central point that we all use to kind of stay connected to each other and, and stay aware. And, and, um, and if you ever, a lot of people can't necessarily make the, the meeting schedules and time, so I'm just going to give you all the website right now in case you're writing it down or this is just being recorded or whatnot. Um, it's www.occupy-detroit.us, and you'll find all of the information, all of the events and schedules and stuff like that through that website, which is fully run by our media team. Uh, another thing they do is they also run a Facebook page and, um, uh, okay. oh, and live streaming. Because live streaming has become so completely important to make sure that the wrong information isn't being spread about the work that we're doing. You know, to make sure that when we do show up for these actions, that the media doesn't turn them into some kind of joke like they were doing at first, where they were trying to only show the clips of like the most idiot sounding Occupy folks involved in these actions. They do that on purpose, we're all aware of it. So now it's really great when you watch the full footage and you find out that that person is actually super highly qualified, but they only showed you the clip where they, stu where they stuttered. Um, so live streaming is super important. We've been really pushing that a lot. Um, we've collaborated with a lot of unions, a lot of churches, other progressive groups. We've done stuff like with the Snyder's uh, March on Snyder's Mansion, Occupy Flint was there. Uh, several other groups, BAM, uh, whatnot. I'm not going to go through the whole list. Uh, we had an amazing time at the Martin Luther King March downtown. Um, we did a march in solidarity of some Ohio union workers. It actually helped them renegotiate their contracts so they didn't uh, have to take a seat and uh, lose some more worker rights. We effectively closed down the Ambassador Bridge during rush hour one morning. That was amazing. Um, getting signatures to fight these emergency manager laws and overall just fighting these foreclosures. There's a lot of different directions that Occupy wants to go in, and Occupy, Occupy Detroit in particular has a lot of ideas in the mill. Uh, we are moving forward on a lot of different things. You'll never see this movement die. You'll never see it die. These people, all of us, whether we like it or not, are part of the movement. Because if you're part of the 99% and you ever eat a, a, a sandwich that's you know, just full of crap because the man, the man, <laughs> is totally, totally has all the all the strings to pull. Uh, you're a part of Occupy. You can't get away from that fact. So um, that's pretty much that's pretty much what we got. Anybody has other kinds of uh, neighborhood concerns? Please come to our general assemblies. Please get in touch with us. Send work groups information. Whatever you need, get it off your chest share it with us, and we can all kind of bring our minds together and kind of find solutions to these sorts of problems. So that's, that's pretty much it. Does anybody have any questions for me? Covered it all? Yeah? You good? That was super easy. <laughs> Thanks, guys. is the actual Zeitgeist presentation. So um, if you need to take a break for any reason, uh, please do. we got to load it. It's probably going to take five, seven minutes. Um, and then we'll start it up in a, in a couple minutes here. So we'll take a little intermission, five, ten minute intermission, and then be back here for the super duper exciting presentation of the Zeitgeist movement uh, by yours truly, Robert, here.